Part three of The Naval War of eighteen twelve by Theodore Roosevelt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three. These statements are mere assertions unsupported by proof and of such a loose character as to be difficult to refute. As our navy was small, it may be best to take each ship in turn. The only ones of which the British could write authoritatively were, of course, those which they captured. The first one taken was the Wasp. James says many British were discovered among her crew, instancing especially one sailor named Jack Lang. Now, Jack Lang was born in the town of Brunswick, New Jersey, but had been impressed and forced to serve in the British Navy. The same was doubtless true of the rest of the many British seamen of her crew. At any rate, as the only instance James mentions, Jack Lang was an American. He can hardly be trusted for those whom he does not name. Of the ninety-five men composing the crew of the Nautilus when she was captured, six were detained and sent to England to await examination as being suspected of being British subjects. Footnote Quoted from Letter of Commodore Rogers of September 12th, 1812 In Naval Archives, Captain's Letters, Volume 25, Number 43 Enclosing a list of American prisoners of war discharged out of custody of Lieutenant William Miller agent at the port of Halifax, in exchange for some of the British captured by Porter. This list, by the way, shows the crew of the Nautilus, counting the six men detained as British, to have been ninety-five in number, instead of one hundred six, as stated by James. Commodore Rogers adds that he has detained twelve men of the Guerrier's crew as an offset to the six men belonging to the Nautilus. End of footnote. Of the other small brigs, the Viper, Vixen, Rattlesnake, and Siren, James does not mention the composition of the crew, and I do not know that any were claimed as British. Of the crew of the Argus, about ten or twelve were believed to be British subjects. The American officers swore the crew contained none. Parenthesis, James, Naval Occurrences, page 278. Close parenthesis. From zero to ten per cent can be allowed. When the frolic was captured, her crew consisted of Native Americans. Parenthesis, from the previous source, page 340. Close parenthesis. James speaks. Parenthesis, history, page 418, close parenthesis, of a portion of the British subjects on board the Essex, but without giving a word of proof or stating his grounds of belief. One man was claimed as a deserter by the British, but he turned out to be a New Yorker. There were certainly a certain number of British aboard, but the number probably did not exceed thirty. Of the President's crew, he says, parenthesis, Naval Occurrences, page 448, close parenthesis, in the opinion of several British officers, there were among them many British seamen, but Commodore Decatur, Lieutenant Gallagher, and the other officers swore that there were none. Of the crew of the Chesapeake, he says, about 32 were British subjects, or about 10%. One or two of these were afterwards shot, and some twenty-five, together with a Portuguese boatswain mate, entered into the British service. So that of the vessels captured by the British, the Chesapeake had the largest number of British, about ten per cent of her crew, on board, the others ranging from that number down to none at all, as in the case of the Wasp. As these eleven ships would probably represent a fair average, this proportion of zero to ten per cent should be taken as the proper one. James, however, is of the opinion that 
those ships manned by americans were more apt to be captured than those manned by the braver british which calls for an examination of the crews of the remaining vessels of the american sloop peacock james says parenthesis naval occurrences page three forty eight close parenthesis that several of her men were recognized as british seamen even if this were true several could not probably mean more than sixteen or ten per cent of the second wasp he says captain blakely was a native of dublin and along with some english and scotch did not it may be certain neglect to have in his crew a great many irish now captain blakely left ireland when he was but sixteen months old and the rest of james's statement is avowedly mere conjecture it was asserted positively in the american newspapers that the wasp which sailed from portsmouth was manned exclusively by new englanders except a small draft of men from a baltimore privateer and that there was not a foreigner in her crew of the hornet james states that some of her men were natives of the united kingdom but he gives no authority and the men he refers to were in all probability those spoken of in the journal of one of the hornet's officers which says that many of our men americans had been impressed in the british service as regards the gunboats james asserts that they were commanded by commodore joshua barney a native of ireland this officer however was born at baltimore on july sixth seventeen fifty nine as to the constitution brenton as already mentioned supposes the number of british sailors in her crew to have been two hundred james makes it less or about one hundred fifty respecting this the only definite statements i can find in british works are the following in the naval chronicle volume twenty nine page four fifty two an officer of the java states that most of the constitution's men were british many being from the guerriere which should be read in connection with james's statement volume six page one fifty six that but eight of the guerriere's crew deserted and but two shipped on board the constitution moreover as a matter of fact these eight men were all impressed americans in the naval chronicle it is also said that the chesapeake's surgeon was an irishman formerly of the british navy he was born in baltimore and was never in the british navy in his life the third lieutenant was supposed to be an irishman brenton volume two four fifty six the first lieutenant was a native of great britain we have been informed parenthesis james volume six page one ninety four close parenthesis he was mr george parker born and bred in virginia the remaining three citations if true prove nothing one man had served under mr kent of the guerriere parenthesis james volume six page one fifty three one had been in the achille and one in the Eurydice. Brenton, volume two page four fifty six these three men were most probably american seamen who had been impressed on british ships from cooper parenthesis in putnam's magazine volume one page five ninety three as well as from several places in the constitution's log footnote see her log book parenthesis volume two february first eighteen twelve to december thirteenth eighteen thirteen close parenthesis especially on july twelfth when twelve men were discharged in some of hull's letters he alludes to the desire of the british part of the crew to serve on the gunboats or in the ports and then writes that in accordance with the instructions sent him by the secretary of the navy 
he had allowed the British-born portion to leave the ship. The logbooks are in the Bureau of Navigation. End of footnote. We learn that several of the crew who were British deserters were discharged from the Constitution before she left port, as they were afraid to serve in a war against Great Britain. That this fear was justifiable may be seen by reading James, volume 4, page 483. Of the four men taken by the leopard from the Chesapeake as deserters, one was hung and three scourged. In reality, the crew of the Constitution probably did not contain a dozen British sailors. In her last cruises, she was manned almost exclusively by New Englanders. The only remainder vessel is the United States, respecting whose crew some remarkable statements have been made. Marshall, volume 2, page 1019, writes that Commodore Decatur declared there was not a seaman in his ship who had not served from five to twelve years in a British man-of-war, from which he concludes that they were British themselves. It may be questioned whether Decatur ever made such an assertion, or if he did, it is safe to assume again that his men were long impressed Americans. Footnote. At the beginning of the war there were on record in the American State Department six thousand two hundred and fifty seven cases of impressed American seamen. These could represent but a small part of the whole, which must have amounted to twenty thousand men, or more than sufficient to man our entire navy five times over. According to the British Admiralty Report to the House of Commons, February 1st, 1815, 2,548 impressed American seamen who refused to serve against their country were imprisoned in 1812. According to Lord Castlereagh's speech in the House, February 18th, 1813, 3,300 men claiming to be American subjects were serving in the British Navy in January 1811, and he certainly did not give anything like the whole number. In the American service, the term of enlistment extended for two years, and the frigate, United States referred to, had not had her crew for any very great length of time as yet. If such a crew were selected at random from American sailors, among them there would be, owing to the small number serving in our own navy, and the enormous number impressed into the British navy, probably but one of the former to two of the latter. As already mentioned, the Americans always left a British man of war as soon as he could, by desertion or discharge but he had no unwillingness to serve in the home navy, where the pay was larger and the discipline far more humane, not to speak of motives of patriotism. Even if the ex-British man-of-war man kept out of service for some time, he would be very apt to enlist when a war broke out, which his country undertook largely to avenge his own wrongs. End of footnote. Of the Carolina's crew of seventy men, five were British. This fact was not found out till three deserted when an investigation was made and the two other British discharged. Captain Henley, in reporting these facts, made no concealment of his surprise that there should be any British at all in his crew. Footnote. See his letters in Letters of Master's Commandant, 1814, Volume 1, number 116. End of footnote. From these facts and citations, we may accordingly conclude that the proportion of British seamen serving on American ships after the war broke out varied between none, as on the Wasp and Constitution, to ten percent, as on the Chesapeake and Essex. On the average, nine tenths of each of our crews were American seamen, and about one-twentieth 
British, the remainder being a mixture of various nationalities. On the other hand, it is to be said that the British frigate Guerriere had ten Americans among her crew, who were permitted to go below during action, and the Macedonian eight who were not allowed that privilege, three of them being killed. Three of the British sloop Peacock's men were Americans, who were forced to fight against the Hornet. One of them was killed. Two of the Esperviers' men were Americans, who were also forced to fight. When the crew of the Nautilus was exchanged, a number of other American prisoners were sent with them. Among these were a number of American seamen who had been serving in the Shannon, Acasta, Africa, and various other vessels. So there was also a certain proportion of Americans among the British crews, although forming a smaller percentage of them than the British did on board the American ships. In neither case was the number sufficient to at all affect the result. The crews of our ships being thus mainly Native Americans, it may be interesting to try to find out the proportions that were furnished by the different sections of the country. There is not much difficulty about the officers, the captains, masters, commandant, lieutenants, marine officers whose birthplaces are given in the Navy lists of 1816, 240 in all, came from the various states as follows. New Hampshire 5, Massachusetts 20, Rhode Island 11, Connecticut 6, for a total in New England of 42, New York 17, New Jersey 22, Pennsylvania 35, Delaware 4, for a total middle states of 78, the District of Columbia 4, Maryland 46, Virginia 42, North Carolina 4, South Carolina 16, Georgia 2, Louisiana 4, Kentucky 2, for a total from the southern states of 116, total of given birthplaces 240. Thus Maryland furnished both absolutely and proportionately the greatest number of officers, Virginia then the most populous of all the states coming next. Four-fifths of the remainder came from the northern states. It is more difficult to get at the birthplaces of the sailors. Something can be inferred from the number of privateers and letters of mark fitted out. Here Baltimore again headed the list. Following closely came New York, Philadelphia, and the New England coast towns, with alone among the southern ports Charleston, South Carolina. A more accurate idea of the quotas of sailors furnished by the different sections can be arrived at by comparing the total amount of tonnage the country possessed at the outbreak of the war. Speaking roughly, 44% of it belonged to New England, 32% to the Middle States, and 11% to Maryland. This makes it probable, but of course not certain, that three-fourths of the common sailors hailed from the northern states, half the remainder from Maryland, and the rest chiefly from Virginia and South Carolina. Having thus discussed somewhat at length the character of our officers and crews, it will now be necessary to present some statistical tables to give a more accurate idea of the composition of the navy, the tonnage, complements, and armaments of the ships, etc. At the beginning of the war the government possessed six navy yards, parenthesis, all but the last established in 1801, close parenthesis, as follows. Footnote. Report of Navy Secretary Jones, November 30th, 1814. End of footnote. Number 1. Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Original cost $5,500. Number of men employed 10. Number 2. Charleston, Massachusetts. $39,214. Number of men employed 20. New York. $40,000. 102 men employed. 
Number four, Philadelphia, thirty-seven thousand dollars, thirteen men employed. Number five, Washington, four thousand dollars, thirty-six men employed. Number six, Gosport, twelve thousand dollars, sixteen men employed. In eighteen twelve, the following was the number of officers in the navy. Footnote: List of vessels, etc., by General H. Preble, U.S. Navy, eighteen seventy-four. End of footnote. Twelve captains, ten masters commandant, seventy-three lieutenants, fifty-three masters, three hundred ten midshipmen, forty-two marine officers, for a grand total of five hundred. At the opening of the year, the number of seamen, ordinary seamen, and boys in service was four thousand ten, and enough more were recruited to increase it to five thousand two hundred thirty of whom only two thousand three hundred forty six were destined for the cruising war vessels the remainder being detailed for forts gunboats navy yards the lakes etc footnote report of secretary paul hamilton february twenty first eighteen twelve end of footnote the marine corps was already ample consisting of one thousand five hundred twenty three men footnote ibid end of footnote no regular navy lists were published till eighteen sixteen and i have been able to get very little information respecting the increase in officers and men during eighteen thirteen and eighteen fourteen but we have full returns for eighteen fifteen which may be summarized as follows footnote siebert's statistical annals page six seventy six philadelphia eighteen eighteen and a footnote thirty captains twenty five masters commandant one hundred forty one lieutenants twenty four commanders five hundred ten midshipmen two hundred thirty sailing masters fifty surgeons twelve chaplains fifty pursers ten coast pilots forty five captains clerks eighty surgeons mates five hundred thirty boatswains gunners carpenters and sailmakers two hundred sixty eight boatswains mates gunners mates etc eleven hundred six quarter gunners etc five thousand able seamen six thousand eight hundred forty nine ordinary seamen and boys making a total of fourteen thousand nine hundred sixty with two thousand seven hundred fifteen marines footnote report of secretary b w croninshield april eighteenth eighteen sixteen end of footnote comparing this list with the figures given before it can be seen that during the course of the war our navy grew enormously increasing to between three and four times its original size at the beginning of the year eighteen twelve the navy of the united states on the ocean consisted of the following vessels which either were or could have been made available during the war footnote letter of secretary benjamin stoddart to fifth congress december twenty fourth seventeen ninety eight letter of secretary paul hamilton february twenty first eighteen twelve american state papers volume nineteen page one forty nine see also the history of the navy of the united states by lieutenant g e emmons u s navy parenthesis published in washington eighteen fifty three under the authority of the navy department close parenthesis forty four guns the united states built philadelphia seventeen ninety seven tonnage one thousand five hundred seventy six cost two hundred ninety nine thousand three hundred and thirty six dollars forty four guns the constitution built in boston seventeen ninety seven tonnage one thousand five hundred seventy six cost three hundred two thousand seven hundred eighteen dollars forty four guns the president built in new york eighteen hundred tonnage one thousand five hundred seventy six cost two hundred twenty thousand nine hundred ten dollars thirty eight guns the constellation built in baltimore seventeen ninety seven one thousand two hundred sixty five tons cost 
three hundred fourteen thousand two hundred twelve dollars thirty eight guns the congress portsmouth built in seventeen ninety nine tonnage one thousand two hundred sixty eight cost one hundred ninety seven thousand two hundred forty six dollars thirty eight guns the chesapeake norfolk built in seventeen ninety nine tonnage one thousand two hundred forty four cost two hundred and twenty thousand six hundred seventy seven dollars thirty two guns the essex salem built in seventeen ninety nine eight hundred and sixty tons cost one hundred and thirty nine thousand three hundred and sixty two dollars twenty eight guns the adams new york built in seventeen ninety nine tonnage five hundred and sixty cost of seventy six thousand six hundred and twenty two dollars eighteen guns the hornet baltimore built in eighteen o five tonnage four hundred and eighty cost fifty two thousand six hundred and three dollars eighteen guns the wasp washington built in eighteen o six four hundred and fifty tons cost forty thousand dollars sixteen guns the argus boston built in eighteen o three two hundred and ninety eight tons cost thirty seven thousand four hundred twenty eight dollars sixteen guns the siren philadelphia eighteen o three two hundred and fifty tons cost thirty two thousand five hundred twenty one dollars fourteen guns the nautilus baltimore built eighteen o three one hundred eighty five tons cost eighteen thousand seven hundred sixty three dollars fourteen guns the vixen baltimore built eighteen o three one hundred eighty five tons cost twenty thousand eight hundred seventy two dollars twelve guns the enterprise baltimore built seventeen ninety nine one hundred sixty five tons cost sixteen thousand two hundred forty dollars twelve guns the viper was purchased eighteen ten one hundred and forty eight tons there also appeared on the lists the new york thirty six guns boston twenty eight guns and john adams twenty eight guns the two former were condemned hulks the latter was entirely rebuilt after the war the hornet was originally a brig of four hundred forty tons and eighteen guns having been transformed into a ship she was pierced for twenty guns and in size was of an intermediate grade between the wasp and the heavy sloops built somewhat later of five hundred nine tons her armament consisted of thirty two pound carronades with the exception of the two bow guns which were long twelves the whole broadside was in nominal weight just three hundred pounds in actual weight about two hundred seventy seven pounds her complement of men was one hundred forty but during the war she generally left port with one hundred fifty footnote in the hornet's log of october twenty fifth eighteen twelve while in port it is mentioned that she had one hundred fifty eight men four men who were sick were left behind before she started parenthesis see in the navy archives the log book hornet wasp and argus july twentieth eighteen o nine to october sixth eighteen thirteen close parenthesis end of footnote the wasp had been a ship from the beginning mounted the number of guns she rated parenthesis of the same calibers as the hornets close parenthesis and carried some ten men less she was about the same length as the british eighteen gun brig sloop but being narrower measured nearly thirty tons less the argus and siren were similar and very fine brigs the former being the longer each carried two more guns than she rated and the argus in addition had a couple thrust through the bridle ports the guns were twenty-four pound carronades with two long twelves 
for bow chasers the proper complement of men was one hundred but each sailed usually with about one hundred twenty five the four smaller craft were originally schooners armed with the same number of light long guns as they rated and carrying some seventy men apiece but they had been very effectually ruined by being changed into brigs with crews increased to a hundred men each was armed with eighteen pound carronades carrying two more than she rated the enterprise in fact mounted sixteen guns having two long nines thrust through the bridle ports these little brigs were slow but very seaworthy and overcrowded with men and guns they all fell into the enemy's hands without doing any good whatever with the exception of the enterprise which escaped capture by sheer good luck and in her only battle happened to be pitted against one of the corresponding and equally bad class of british gun brigs the adams after several changes of form finally became a flush-decked corvette the essex had originally mounted twenty-six long twelves on her main deck and sixteen twenty-four pound carronades on her spar deck but official wisdom changed this giving her forty-six guns twenty-four thirty-two pound carronades and two long twelves on the main deck and sixteen thirty-two pound carronades with four long twelves on the spar deck when captain porter had command of her he was deeply sensible of the disadvantages of an armament which put him at the mercy of any ordinary antagonist who could choose his distance accordingly he petitioned several times but always without success to have his long twelves returned to him the american thirty-eights were about the size of the british frigates of the same rate and armed almost exactly in the same way each having twenty-eight long eighteens on the main deck and twenty thirty-two pound carronades on the spar deck the proper complement was three hundred men but each carried from thirty to eighty more footnote the chesapeake by some curious mistake was frequently rated as a forty-four and this drew in its train a number of attendant errors when she was captured james says that in one of her lockers was found a letter dated in february eighteen eleven from robert smith the secretary of war to captain evans at boston directing him to open the houses of rendezvous for manning the chesapeake and enumerating her crew at a total of four hundred forty three naturally this gave british historians the idea that such was the ordinary complement of our thirty-eight gun frigates but the ordering so large a crew was merely a mistake as may be seen by a letter from captain bainbridge to the secretary of the navy which is given in full in the captain's letters volume twenty five number nineteen parenthesis navy archives close parenthesis in it he mentions the extraordinary number of men ordered for the chesapeake saying there is a mistake in the crew ordered for the chesapeake as it equals in number the crews of our forty four gun frigates whereas the chesapeake is of the class of the congress and constellation and a footnote our three forty four gun ships were the finest frigates then afloat although the british possessed some as heavy such as the egyptienne forty four they were beautifully modelled with very thick scantling extremely stout masts and heavy cannon each carried on her main deck thirty long twenty fours and on her spar deck two long bow chasers and twenty or twenty two carronades forty two pounders on the president and the united states thirty two pounders on the constitution each sailed with a crew of about four hundred fifty men fifty in excess of the regular complement footnote the president when in action with the endymion had four hundred fifty men aboard as sworn by decatur 
the muster roll of the constitution a few days before her action with the guerrier contains four hundred sixty four names parenthesis including fifty one marines close parenthesis eight men were absent in a prize so she had aboard in the action four hundred fifty six her muster roll just before the action with the cayenne and levant shows four hundred sixty one names End of footnote. It may be as well to mention here the only other class of vessels that we employed during the war. This was composed of the ship sloops built in 1813, which got to sea in 1814. They were very fine vessels, measuring 509 tons apiece. Footnote. The dimensions were 117 feet 11 inches upon the gun deck, 97 feet 6 inches keel for tonnage, measuring from one foot before the forward perpendicular and along the base line to the front of the rabat of the port, deducting three-fifths of the moulded breadth of the beam, which is 31 feet 6 inches, making 509 and 21 95th tons see in naval archives contracts volume two page one hundred thirty seven and a footnote with very thick scantling and stout masts and spars each carried thirty two pound carronades and two long twelves with a crew nominally of one hundred sixty men but with usually a few supernumeraries footnote the peacock had one hundred sixty six men as we learn from her commander warrington's letter of june first parenthesis letter number one forty in masters commandant letters eighteen fourteen volume one close parenthesis the frolic took aboard ten or twelve men beyond her regular complement parenthesis see letter of joseph bainbridge number fifty one in the same volume close parenthesis Accordingly, when she was captured by the Orpheus, the commander of the latter, Captain Hugh Pigott, reported the number of men aboard to be 171. The Wasp left port with 173 men, with which she fought her first action. She had a much smaller number aboard in her second. End of footnote. The British vessels encountered were similar, but generally inferior to our own. The only twenty-four-pounder frigate we encountered was the Endymion, of about a fifth less force than the President. Their thirty-eight-gun frigates were almost exactly like ours, but with fewer men in crew as a rule. They were three times matched against our forty-four-gun frigates, to which they were inferior about as three is to four. Their thirty-six-gun frigates were larger than the Essex, with a more numerous crew, but the same number of guns. Carrying on the lower deck, however, long eighteens instead of thirty-two-pound carronades, a much more effective armament. The thirty-two-gun frigates were smaller, with long twelves on the main deck. The largest sloops were also frigate-built, carrying twenty-two thirty-two-pound carronades on the main deck, and twelve lighter guns on the quarter-deck and forecastle, with a crew of one hundred eighty. The large flush-deck ship sloops carried twenty-one or twenty-three guns, with a crew of one hundred forty men. But our vessels most often came in contact with the British eighteen-gun brig-sloop. This was a tubby craft, heavier than any of our brigs, being about the size of the Hornet. The crew consisted of from 110 to 135 men. Ordinarily, each was armed with 16 32-pound carronades, two long sixes, and a shifting 12-pound carronade, often with a light long gun as a stern chaser, making 20 in all. The reindeer and peacock had only twenty-four pound carronades. The epervier had but eighteen guns. All carronades. Footnote. The epervier 
was taken into our service under the same name and rate both preble and emmons describe her as four hundred seventy seven tons warrington her captor however says the surveyor of the port has just measured the epervier and reports her four hundred sixty seven tons parenthesis in the navy archives master's commandant letters eighteen fourteen volume one number one twenty five close parenthesis for a full discussion of tonnage see appendix a end of footnote among the stock accusations against our navy of eighteen twelve were and are statements that our vessels were rated at less than their real force and in particular that our large frigates were disguised line of battle ships as regards the ratings most vessels of that time carried more guns than they rated the disparity was less in the french than in either the british or american navies our thirty-eight gun frigates carried forty-eight guns the exact number the british thirty-eighths possessed the worst case of underrating in our navy was the essex which rated thirty-two and carried forty-six guns so that her real was forty-four per cent in excess of her nominal force but this was not as bad as the british sloop cayenne which was rated at twenty or twenty-two and carried thirty-four guns so that she had either fifty-five or seventy per cent greater real than nominal force at the beginning of the war we owned two eighteen-gun ship sloops one mounting eighteen and the other twenty guns the eighteen-gun brig sloops they captured mounted each nineteen guns so the average was the same later we built sloops that rated eighteen and mounted twenty-two guns but when one was captured it was also put down in the british navy list as an eighteen-gun ship sloop during all the combats of the war there were but four vessels that carried as few guns as they rated two were british the the epervier and the levant and two american the wasp and adams one navy was certainly as deceptive as another as far as underrating went the force of the statement that our large frigates were disguised line of battle ships of course depends entirely upon what the words frigate and line of battleship mean when on the tenth of august sixteen fifty three de reuter saved a great convoy by beating off sir george icecoff's fleet of thirty-eight sail the largest of the dutch admiral's thirty-three sail of the line carried but thirty guns and one hundred fifty men and his own flagship but twenty-eight guns and one hundred thirty-four men footnote la vie et la action memorable de sir michel de reuter à amsterdam chez henri et theodore boom sixteen seventy seven the work is by barthelemy pilat a surgeon in de reuter's fleet and personally present during many of his battles it is written in french but it is in tone more strongly anti-french than anti-english and of footnote the dutch book from which this statement is taken speaks indifferently of frigates of eighteen forty and fifty-eight guns toward the end of the eighteenth century the terms that crystallize frigate then meant a so-called single-decked ship it in reality possessed two decks the main or gun deck and the upper one which had no name at all until our sailors christened it spar deck the gun deck possessed a complete battery and the spar deck an interrupted one mounting guns on the forecastle and quarter deck at that time all two decked or three decked in reality three and four decked ships were liners but in eighteen twelve this had changed somewhat as the various nations built more and more powerful vessels the lower rates of the different divisions were dropped 
thus the british ship cayenne captured by the constitution was in reality a small frigate with a main deck battery of twenty two guns and twelve decks on the spar deck a few years before she would have been called a twenty four gun frigate but she then ranked merely as a twenty two gun sloop similarly the fifty and sixty four gun ships that had fought in the line at the Doggerbank, Camperdown, and even at Abacour, were now no longer deemed fit for the purpose, and the 74 was the lowest line of battleship. The Constitution, President, and States must then be compared with the existing European vessels that were classed as frigates. The French in 1812 had no 24-pounder frigates, for the very good reason that they had all fallen victims to the English eighteen-pounders. But in July of that year a Danish frigate, the Nyaden, which carried long twenty-fours, was destroyed by the English ship Dictator 64. The British frigates were of several rates, the lowest rated thirty-two, carrying in all forty guns, twenty-six long twelves on the main deck and fourteen twenty-four pound carronades on the spar deck a broadside of three hundred twenty-four pounds footnote in all these vessels there were generally two long sixes or nines substituted for the bow chase carronades End of footnote. the thirty-six gun frigates like the phoebe carried forty-six guns twenty-six long eighteens on the gun deck and thirty-two pound carronades above the thirty-eight gun frigates like the macedonian carried forty-eight or forty-nine guns long eighteens below and thirty-two pound carronades above the thirty-two gun frigates then presented in broadside thirteen long twelves below and seven twenty-four pound carronades above the thirty-eight gun frigates fourteen long eighteens below and ten thirty-two pound carronades above so that a forty-four gun frigate would naturally present fifteen long twenty-fours and twelve forty-two pound carronades above as the united states did at first the rate was perfectly proper for french british and danes already possessed twenty-four pounder frigates and there was really less disparity between the force and rate of a forty-four that carried fifty-four guns than there was in a thirty-eight that carried forty-nine or like the shannon fifty-two nor was this all two of our three victories were won by the constitution which only carried thirty-two pound carronades and once fifty-four and once fifty-two guns and as two-thirds of the work was thus done by this vessel i shall now compare her with the largest british frigates her broadside force consisted of fifteen long twenty-fours on the main deck and on the spar deck one long twenty-four and in one case ten in the other eleven thirty-two pound carronades a broadside of seven hundred and four to seven hundred thirty-six pounds footnote nominally in reality about seven per cent less on account of the short weight in the metal and of footnote there was then in the british navy the acosta forty carrying in broadside fifteen long eighteens and eleven thirty-two pound carronades when the spar deck batteries are equal the addition of ninety pounds to the main deck broadside Parenthesis, which is all the superiority of the constitution over the acosta parenthesis, is certainly not enough to make the distinction between a frigate and a disguised seventy-four but not considering the acosta there were in the british navy three twenty-four pound frigates indefatigable the cornwallis and endymion we only came in contact with the latter in eighteen fifteen when the constitution had but fifty-two guns the endymion then had an armament of twenty-eight long twenty-fours two long eighteens and twenty thirty-two pound carronades making a broadside of 
six hundred seventy four pounds footnote according to james six hundred sixty four pounds he omits the chase guns for no reason End of footnote or including a shifting twenty four pound carronade of six hundred ninety eight pounds just six pounds or one per cent less than the force of that disguised line of battleship the constitution as the endymion only rated as a forty and the constitution as a forty four it was in reality the former and not the latter which was under rated i have taken the constitution because the british had more to do with her than they did with our other two forty fours taken together the latter were both of heavier metal than the constitution carrying forty two pound carronades in eighteen twelve the united states carried her full fifty four guns throwing a broadside of eight hundred forty six pounds when captured the president carried fifty three having substituted a twenty four pound carronade for two of her forty twos and her broadside amounted to eight hundred twenty eight pounds or sixteen per cent nominal and on account of the short weight of her shot nine per cent real excess over the endymion if this difference made her a line of battle ship then the endymion was doubly a line of battle ship compared to the congress or constellation moreover the american commanders found their forty two pound carronades too heavy as i have said the constitution only mounted thirty twos and the united states landed six of her guns when in eighteen thirteen she attempted to break the blockade she carried but forty eight guns throwing a broadside of seven hundred twenty pounds just three per cent more than the endymion footnote it was on account of this difference of three per cent that captain hardy refused to allow the endymion to meet the states parenthesis james volume six page four seventy close parenthesis this was during the course of some challenges and counter challenges which ended in nothing decatur in his turn being unwilling to have the macedonian meet the statira unless the latter should agree not to take on a picked crew he was perfectly right in this but he ought never to have sent the challenge at all as two ships but an hour or two out of port would be at a frightful disadvantage in a fight End of footnote. if our frigates were line of battle ships the disguise was certainly marvellously complete and they had a number of companions equally disguised in the british ranks the forty fours were thus true frigates with one complete battery of long guns and one interrupted one of carronades that they were better than any other frigates was highly creditable to our ingenuity and national skill we cannot perhaps lay claim to the invention and first use of the heavy frigate for twenty-four pounder frigates were already in the service of at least three nations and the french thirty-six pound carronade in use on their spar decks threw a heavier ball than our forty-two pounder but we had enlarged and perfected the heavy frigate and were the first nation that ever used it effectively the french forte and the danish nyaden shared the fate of ships carrying guns of lighter calibre and the british twenty-four pounders like the endymion had never accomplished anything hitherto there had been a strong feeling especially in england that an eighteen-pound gun was as effective as a twenty-four in arming a frigate we made a complete revolution in this respect england had been building only eighteen-pounder vessels when she ought to have been building twenty-four pounders it was greatly to our credit that our average frigate was superior to the average british frigate exactly as it was to our discredit 
that the Essex was so ineffectively armed. Captain Porter owed his defeat chiefly to his ineffective guns, but also to having lost his topmast, to the weather being unfavorable, and still more to the admirable skill with which Heliar used his superior armament. The Java, Macedonian, and Guerrier owed their defeat partly to their lighter guns, but much more to the fact that their captains and seamen did not display either as good seamanship or as good gunnery as their foes. Inferiority in armament was a factor to be taken into account in all the four cases, but it was more marked in that of the Essex than in the other three. It would have been fairer for Porter to say that he had been captured by a line of battleship than for the captain of the Java to make that assertion. In this last case, the forces of the two ships compared almost exactly as their rates. A forty-four was matched against a thirty-eight. It was not surprising that she would win, but it was surprising that she should win with ease and impunity. The long twenty-fours on the Constitution gun-deck no more made her a line of battleship than the thirty-two-pound carronades mounted on an English frigate's quarter-deck and forecastle made her a line of battleship when opposed to a Frenchman with only eights and sixes on her spar-deck, when, a few years before, the English Phoebe had captured the French Neride, their broadsides were respectively 407 and 258 pounds, a greater disparity than in any of our successful fights, yet no author thought of claiming that the Phoebe was anything but a frigate so with the Clyde throwing 425 pounds, which took the Vastale throwing but 246. The facts were that 18-pounder frigates had captured 12-pounders, exactly as our 24-pounders, in turn, captured the 18-pounders. Shortly before Great Britain declared war on us, one of our 18-pounder frigates the San Florenzo, throwing 476 pounds in a broadside, captured the 12-pounder French frigate Psyche, whose broadside was only 246 pounds. The force of the former was thus almost double that of the latter, yet the battle was long and desperate, the English losing 48 and the French 124 men. This conflict, then, reflected as much credit on the skill and seamanship of the defeated as of the victorious side. The difference in loss could fairly be ascribed to the difference in weight of metal. But where, as in the famous ship duels of 1812, the difference in force is only a fifth instead of a half, and yet the slaughter, instead of being as five is to two, is as six to one, then the victory is certainly to be ascribed as much to superiority in skill as to superiority in force. But on the other hand, it should always be remembered that there was a very decided superiority in force. It is a very discreditable feature of many of our naval histories that they utterly ignore this superiority, seeming ashamed to confess that it existed. In reality it was something to be proud of. It was highly to the credit of the United States that her frigates were of better make and armament than any others. It always speaks well for a nation's energy and capacity that any of her implements of warfare are of a superior kind. This is a perfectly legitimate reason for pride. It spoke well for the Prussians in 1866 that they opposed breech-loaders to the muzzle-loaders of the Austrians, but it would be folly to give all the credit of the victory to the breech-loaders and none to Mulkey and his lieutenants. Thus it must be remembered that two things contributed to our victories. One was the excellent make and 
armament of our ships the other was the skilful seamanship excellent discipline and superb gunnery of the men who were in them british writers are apt only to speak of the first and americans only of the last whereas both should be taken into consideration end of part three